Hello everyone, my name is Brandon Ferguson and my presentation is called Source Marker Continuous Feedback for Developers. It is my hope that this talk excites software developers about a novel way for developing and operating software in tandem. This software is still in early development, so if you have any suggestions, I would be very eager to hear them. Like I said, my name is Brandon Ferguson. I'm a software developer by trade, and these days I primarily find myself working on AI-based pair programming technology. If that or anything in this talk interests you, there's my email. Feel free to message me. For an idea of how I structure this talk, I've included a brief agenda. First, I'll offer my perspective and introduce an issue I see, a possible solution to that issue, my implementation and demonstration of that solution, and then I'll finish the talk off with where I think this type of technology is headed. So before we can talk about where things are headed, I'd like to give some perspective about where I believe the field of software development has come from and where it is. My motivating belief for this talk is that the lines between software development and software operation are becoming increasingly blurred. That is to say that these days, developing software invariably involves operating software and operating software invariably involves developing software. You can see that trend happening with the rise of low no-code development and serverless computing. It's even easier to see that trend when you look at how we create software compared to how we used to create software. One of the earliest methodologies we used for creating software was called the waterfall methodology, which involved a long stage of designing followed by a long stage of building and so on. Each stage in the style of development would only start once the previous stage was completely finished and we called that completion a milestone. And a consequence of this style of software development is that there's a long interval between designing features and delivering or deploying those features. The reason being, the waterfall methodology is an everything or nothing sort of methodology. You either get all the features or you get none of the features. Here you can see that there are four features to deliver and all four features are delivered together. You can visualize the waterfall methodology like this, a long period of little to no value followed by a rapid increase in value once the entire product with all the features is delivered. Then we improved on this process and we developed the agile methodology. Here you can see we've shortened the amount of time we spend on each stage and instead of milestones, we have sprints. Whereas a milestone indicated we were done with a specific stage for the life of the product, a sprint simply indicates that we've delivered or deployed some features, and now it's time to do it again with even more features. Here you can see, instead of delivering all four features at once, two features are delivered at a time. Whereas milestones are typically measured in months, sprints are typically measured in weeks, and the reason why sprints can be completed in weeks is because they deliver fewer features at a time. Instead of delivering all four features at once, as with the waterfall methodology, the Agile methodology incentivizes smaller groupings of features with additional features coming via software updates. And then finally, we have what's known as a DevOps methodology. This is where we get concepts such as continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. One of the first things you notice about this methodology is that there are no milestones or sprints. This methodology automates the process of delivering features so well that the act of delivering or deploying something is not seen as a special event, but rather as a non-event. It is viewed as just another step among many other steps in the process of developing software. And what the DevOps methodology allows you to do is to get features delivered faster than all the other methodologies before it. Instead of taking months to complete a milestone or weeks to complete a sprint, you can deliver features in a matter of hours or days, the limiting factor being however long it takes to code and test those features. The reason why the DevOps methodology can do this is because it provides the infrastructure to deliver features one at a time, given that this process is heavily automated. You can see the difference between the DevOps and the waterfall methodologies when you contrast how they deliver value. Using the waterfall methodology, you need to know upfront what value you'll be delivering, and until you realize that, you typically aren't providing any value. Conversely, the DevOps methodology provides much more flexibility by allowing you to incrementally improve value over time. You can release a feature, see how well it's received, and then use that reception as a catalyst for determining how to maximize the value your software provides. Consequently, increasing software operations influence on software development, which explains the rise in software monitoring and observability technology. In the waterfall methodology, a relationship between software development and software operation does exist, but they're fairly far removed from each other. Before everything was connected to the internet, software was often physically shipped inside products, and that software was difficult to update. And when software is difficult to update, ideally you want all the features that are necessary or desired to be pre-included. Again, the everything or nothing sort of mythology. And a consequence of this mythology is that the team that supports the operations of the software is often completely different than the team which developed it. Then we move to the Agile mythology. In the Agile mythology, the gap between software development and software operation dramatically decreased. 
This methodology is less useful for products which are difficult to update and require the everything or nothing sort of delivery, but can be very useful for software which is easy to update. You still have a team dedicated to development and a team dedicated to operation, but in the Agile mythology, there is an increased amount of communication happening between these teams. And then finally, we moved on to the DevOps mythology. Using the DevOps mythology, the gap between software development and software operation dramatically decreased yet again. Now we're almost to a point where there is no gap. An example of this small gap can be seen with technologies such as function as a service architecture. This technology enables us to build and operate vastly scalable applications with not much more than an internet connection and a bit of programming knowledge. The DevOps mythology has created a gap between software development and software operations so small that we even have those that jump back and forth between these practices. These are the ones we call our DevOps engineers, and I think that's progress. So then what's the issue? Well, I believe the issue is that even though the lines between software development and software operation are becoming increasingly blurred, most still view these practices like so which is essentially that they're completely different practices which require completely different teams. And this mostly makes sense when you see how different the typical environment involved with these practices appear. As software developers, we consider the IDE to be close to, if not the heart of our profession. Almost everything we do related to software development, we do inside of our IDEs. To us, an application is mainly a collection of logic and configuration files. As software operators, we have a much different view of that very same application. An application is less a collection of logic and configuration files and more of a system of services, each with various health and operational metrics which indicate the current state of the application. The logic of how the application works means much less to a software operator as they are less interested in specifics and more interested in the overall condition of the entire application. One way to see this distinction is that software developers think about how an application could or should be used, and software operators think about how an application is used in actuality. And when you show developers dashboards formulated by the software they develop, well, you get a responses like these. They'll say, that's an operations thing, or our DevOps guy handles the whole monitoring and tools thing. This is because even though these metrics describe how source code operates, Developers have difficulty relating these metrics and their meanings into the source code that they create inside of their IDEs. So instead, what you find is that developers, before utilizing existing metrics, much rather rely on their experience and intuition to solve problems. Yes, developers will turn to metrics, but this is more of a last ditch effort. Given an issue in production, most developers would rather jump straight to the source code and think about what should have happened and start guessing at what must have happened for the issue to occur. Even when you have monitoring data, which makes it obvious what the issue is, to developers, source code is software. Software is source code. Everything stems from source code. The source code should explain why the issue is occurring, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the source code will make it obvious. And this is problematic if developers only care about source code, given that source code is only showing you a portion of reality. It is a description of software. And when developers refuse to integrate operational data into their development activities, they are essentially arguing that the map is the territory, that the menu is the meal. The reality is that the map is not the territory. And in the same way that a menu only represents what a meal should be, source code only represents what software should do. Instead, to know what software actually does, you need to include operational data into your thinking. Only then will you get the entire scope of software. Remember, source code only explains what software can do. It is operational data that explains what software actually did. As software developers, we should care just as much, if not more, about how software actually operates as we do about how it was designed to. If we are not viewing source code and operational data in tandem, then figuratively, when we're programming, we might as well be programming while squinting. We can make out how software should work, but not how it will work. Looking at a method, we have an idea if it should take a short or long time to run, but really we're just guessing. And when we're investigating production issues, we follow the source code thinking, it should have done this, and then it should have went here. And we're not thinking, here's exactly what it did in that instance, and here is why it broke. And the fact that we don't think in those terms of absolutes just goes to show that source code by itself cannot tell the whole story. Given that developers are creating software with a limited view, the menu as opposed to the mill, I believe the solution is then to somehow create a more holistic view of software by combining source code with the operational data it produces. This is the exact idea about a process called feedback-driven development, effectively continuous feedback. Feedback-driven development works by integrating runtime monitoring data from production deployments of the software into the tools that developers utilize in their daily workflows to enable tighter feedback loops. Conceptually, this process looks something like this. We start with a developer who creates some source code in their IDE. They do their testing, and once it's ready for production, 
they trigger an application deployment via committing code, merging branches, etc. Once their code is finally used in production, it'll ultimately produce some operational data, data like service load, response times, traces, logs, and various other metrics. In feedback-driven development, as this operational data is produced, it eventually makes its way back to the developer's IDE, where they can use that data to see how their source code is operating and help them make future decisions on how best to operate their software. What you can immediately see from the feedback-driven development approach is that there is a nice little loop between the IDE and the application. As you change the source code, the operational data changes, which you can use to change the source code, which changes the operational data, and so on. And thus, why they call it feedback-driven development. You are using feedback gathered from your application during the development of that very application. Now, this is a very simplistic conceptual understanding of feedback-driven development, since feedback-driven development does not actually involve sending raw operations data back to developer's IDE. If it did, you would end up with essentially turning the IDE into yet another operational dashboard, which wouldn't change developers seeing operations as an operation thing. Instead, feedback-driven development isn't about giving developers raw operations data, but rather, feedback-driven development is about making operations data actionable for software developers. And this is achieved by giving developers feedback in the form of advice, not just raw data. So instead of simply streaming operations data back to developers, there are two processes which operations data goes through before getting back to developers. And these processes are called feedback mapping and feedback control. Feedback control acts like a database for operations data. Its job is to collect, filter, and aggregate operations data. Feedback mapping acts like an intermediator between the source code and the aggregated operations data. Its job is to take specific source code, find the aggregated operations data that it produced, link them together, and surface any advice which can be extracted via analysis of that combined structure. Adding both of these processes together, instead of sending raw operations data back to the IDE, instead what we send is feedback. This is feedback which developers can use to continuously evaluate and correct their software. Continuous feedback which is actionable for software developers. Now, we'll get into exactly what feedback looks like soon, but first, I think it's important to understand how feedback mapping and feedback control works. Again, feedback control is the process of collecting, filtering, and aggregating operations data. And before you can collect operations data, you first have to produce it, which is typically done via the users of your application. As they make use of your application, your application produces various streams of operational data, which can be monitored. Here we can see some streams of traces, logs, and metrics. This operations data is collected and saved, creating an aggregated data source. And then finally, this aggregated operations data is made available for querying, and this is typically where it's turned into a bunch of charts and dashboards for the operations team. And that's the end of the feedback control process. The feedback control process has successfully collected, filtered, and aggregated operations data. This is where its job stops and where the feedback mapping takes over. Feedback mapping happens simultaneously to feedback control, but it occurs mainly in the developer's IDE as they browse source code. As a developer views source code, it is turned into a dependency graph, not the dependency graph for the entire code base, but more or less just the source code the developer is currently looking at. So it's more like a dependency graph fragment. This dependency graph fragment is then used as the basis for querying the available aggregated operations data. The reason only a fragment is used for querying is because software can contain a large amount of source code and operations data. And at any one point in time, a developer is only interested in a portion of it. And this portion is primarily determined by whatever source code the developer is currently viewing. The aggregated operations data, which was produced by the source code the developer is currently viewing, is returned and combined with the dependency graph, creating a more comprehensive structure called a feedback annotated dependency graph. This is a structure created from static analysis of source code combined with the dynamic analysis of that software undergoing actual production usage. This is the distinguishing feature of feedback-driven development. The data you're integrating with source code is what actually happens in production and not what happens when you run it locally or in a test environment. And then finally, this feedback annotated dependency graph is analyzed to provide near real-time information and cautionary advice based on the current state of production. If production is experiencing issues with user signups and you're viewing user signup code, then you're going to see that happening in real time inside the source code. No websites or dashboards necessary. The source code no longer only represents static logic, but also represents the dynamic state of the source code as it stands in production. A very cool side effect of feedback-driven development is that you can actually navigate operations data by simply navigating source code. I'll show an example of this later. Okay, so given that the feedback-driven development approach involves two processes, feedback mapping and feedback control, the most intuitive approach for implementing feedback-driven development would be to combine these two separate systems, a system for implementing feedback mapping and a system for implementing feedback control. This is what I've done, and I've chosen to implement feedback mapping with a project I'm working on called SourceMarker. 
This project has not been released yet, but I've included a link to the GitHub repository at the end of the presentation where you can follow its progress, express interests, offer suggestions, and things like that. For feedback control, I've chosen to implement that with an existing project called Apache Skywalking. This is a project I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, but if not, it is a very popular open source application performance management system with a lot of useful features that make feedback control really easy to implement. Okay, so how can we use Apache Skywalking to implement feedback control? Remember, feedback control involves producing, filtering, collecting, and aggregating operations data. This means that feedback control's job is to start with the cloud application at one end and end with filtered and aggregated operations data at the other end. Producing operations data starts with our cloud application, and this is created naturally as our users make use of our application, so that takes care of producing data, but simply producing data is of very little value if we are not actually monitoring it. This is where Apache Skywalking agents come in. These programs are able to hook into applications and monitor the operations data that the application produces. This allows us to monitor operations data, but everybody's application is different, so the agent by itself isn't enough. It needs to be told specifically what we're interested in monitoring inside of our application. Here we can make use of a plugin the agent comes with called the Customize Enhanced plugin. This plugin allows us to create something called a Trace Enhanced specification, which describes exactly what the agent should monitor. In this specification, we have the ability to specify exactly which classes, methods, data, logs, etc., inside of our application should be monitored. Using our application source code, we can generate the Trace Enhanced specification and combine that with our agents. Together, these components enable us to both filter and transmit the operations data which our application produces. The Trace Enhanced specification handles filtering since it specifies what should and should not be monitored, and the agents handle the actual transmission of the operations data. Now all we need to do is collect and aggregate that operations data. Here is where the Apache Skywalking Observability Analysis Platform comes in. Using this platform, we have a place for collecting the operations data the agent transmits. It allows us to aggregate, save, and query for operations data. But again, applications can be very different, so the operations data they produce can be very different. This means that not all applications are going to want the same rules for how they aggregate their operations data. Apache Skywalking conveniently has an answer for that as well with something they call an observation analysis language script. These scripts allow us to define custom rules for how operations data should be aggregated and saved. Again, using our application source code, we can generate the observation analysis language script and combine that with the observability analysis platform. Together, these components enable us to both collect and aggregate the operations data which the agent transmits. The observation analysis language script handles how the operations data should be aggregated, and the observability analysis platform handles the collecting and saving of aggregated operations data. Combining these three steps together, what you're left with is the filtered and aggregated operations data necessary to fulfill all the requirements of feedback control. Okay, now on to how called source marker is used to implement feedback mapping. Remember, feedback mapping involves correlating source code with operations data, analyzing that structure to provide actionable advice, and bringing that advice to developers' attention inside their IDE. Rather than having something at one end and something at the other end, instead what we have here is a loop, a continuous feedback loop. This loop starts with the IDE, which contains source code. This source code is transformed into a dependency graph, populated with operations data, creating a feedback annotated dependency graph, and then analyzed to produce advice, which is placed back inside the IDE. As the source code and or operations data changes, so does the advice, giving continuous feedback to developers as they develop their application. So then the question becomes, what kind of advice can we provide to software developers? Well, there's primarily two classes of advice we can offer informative advice and cautionary advice. For informative advice, we can of course provide metrics about how long source code takes to operate and how often it operates. We can show what type of data the source code consumed and consequently produced. And we can show several other various advisories which simply state how the source code operated in production. For cautionary advice, we can warn developers when their source code is CPU or memory intensive, and we can even detect when they've created performance anti-patterns. For an example, here's how we can use feedback-driven development to detect when a developer has created what's known as a performance ramp anti-pattern. This is an anti-pattern where you've created some source code which will continually take longer and longer to execute over time. You can often tell when you've created a performance ramp when your service response time trend looks like this. As time progresses, so does the amount of duration required for the service to execute. This does not definitively mean you've created a performance ramp, however, as there can be many different reasons why a service is taking longer to execute. You can also often tell where a performance ramp might appear if you search your source code for things like SQL select statements with no pagination or limits on them. This, however, also does not mean you've created a performance ramp since you may be querying a table with only a few rows in it or a table which never changes. 
It is only once you take that operations data, which suggests a performance ramp, and combine it with the fact that you have source code, which is known to cause performance ramps, that you can actually determine if a performance ramp exists. Here we can see we're doing a select everything from our users table, and it's taking longer to run each time we call it. Using the operations data and source code in tandem, we can safely conclude that a performance ramp does indeed exist. And what this advice does is it gives developers the ability to integrate operations data into their development activities. No longer will they feel that monitoring is an operations thing because they can see how operations data and the source code fit together. In this case, now they can start thinking about adding pagination to their query. Hopefully all that helped explain feedback mapping and feedback control, because now I would like to show a demonstration of how it would look to developer programming with feedback-driven development technology. This is just my implementation and doesn't encapsulate all the possibilities of feedback-driven technology, though it should spark some ideas in your head of how you can program with a more holistic view of software by combining source code and operational data. Let's start with the traditional view of some simple Java source code. Can you tell if there are any production issues happening here? One of the methods throws an exception each time it's called, but can you tell if anyone's ever called it? These are questions you cannot answer if you're just reading source code by itself. However, adding some feedback-driven development-powered icon to the source code, the answers to those questions becomes obvious. Here we've added two icons to the source code, one which indicates a performance ramp has been detected, and one which keeps track of how often an exception has been thrown since the application started. Okay, so that answers our previous questions, but now we might be wondering things like, how often are these methods called? How long does it take when they're called? When was the last time the runtime exception was actually thrown? Again, these are questions that cannot be answered by the source code itself. However, we can add some feedback-driven development-powered inlay hints to answer even those questions. Now we have some near real-time metrics, which answer all of the previous questions we've asked. We can see how often these methods are called, how long they take to run, and how many times they've been called since the application started. Even better, this information is updated in real time, so we can always keep track of the current state of the source code in production. Feedback-driven development-powered icons and inlay hints are very useful for getting developers' attention, but they're not expressive enough for more complex, informative, and cautionary advice. They only offer summarized data, and their main goal is to get the developers' attention so that they will view what's known as the source portal. This is a UI that changes based on the source code you're currently viewing. For example, this source code is a class called Web App Controller, which is a Spring REST controller that contains a couple Git and POST endpoints. Again, reading this source code alone, it's impossible to tell how it's performing in production, besides the fact that Git users are suffering from a performance ramp. But using a keyboard shortcut, we can bring up the source portal in a pop-up above our code, which shows in much greater detail how this entire REST controller is currently operating in production. Here we can see how all of the endpoints we've defined are operating we can see their average throughput, response time, and SLA. And given that this UI is hooked up directly to our IDE, we can navigate our source code by simply clicking what we're interested in. Since the get users endpoint is currently suffering from a performance ramp, let's take a closer look at that by clicking it. Notice how not only the UI changes to show us the get users endpoint in more detail, but also how we've jumped in the source code to the get users method. This allows us to see the source code and the operation data at the same time. We don't need to dig through any dashboards as the correct and specific operational data is already visible. Okay, so given that this get users method has a performance ramp icon, let's verify if that's true. We're looking at the last five minutes and there seems to be an upward trend, but it doesn't look that bad. Let's try looking at how it's performed for the last three hours. We can click the time drop down, select last three hours, and now it's a bit more obvious that the performance ramp advice we're getting seems to be valid. We can see in the last three hours, the average response time has gone from something like 20 milliseconds to almost 900 milliseconds. That appears to be very indicative to a performance ramp, though we can dig even deeper into this problem by looking at some of the collected traces related to this endpoint. So let's click the Traces tab. And here we can view the live request that this source code is currently processing. We can even see the values being passed to this method. In this case, our endpoint only accepts a Boolean, so all we see is trues and falses being processed. Let's click on one of these traces and see if we can figure out why we have a performance ramp warning. We can see that this endpoint is using the Spring Framework. It's making some general computations and it's executing a SQL select statement. If we wanted to, we can get a summary of this trace stack by clicking the trace stack dropdown. And we can see that this trace started and finished at 11.03 PM and overall it was successful. That's all good, but if we go back to the trace stack, we can see that the select statement does have a caution status, 
we can go directly into that to get straight to the issue, but I want to further show how we can navigate operational data and source code in tandem. Currently, we are viewing the summarize trace stack. Let's click the detailed trace stack instead. Now we can see each method that was called during this trace one method at a time. Here I can see the issue is coming from the user service impl get users call, which we passed the value of false to. We can click that method. And again, notice how not only UI changes, but our position in the source code also changes. Now we have the user service impl class looking at the get users method. Here we can see that the caution status comes from the SQL select statement, which is being performed via our execution of the user storage find all call. We can click that to get more information. And we finally reach the root cause of the caution status. Here we can see, yes, the performance ramp was detected and the issue stems from the fact that we're making a select everything from users query. We can also see when it was first detected, when it was last detected, how long it used to take, how long it currently takes, and the percentage increase it's gone through since we've turned our application on. This is actionable information a developer can use to start thinking about the appropriate way to solve this problem. Again, the likely fix is pagination, but that's up to you. SourceMarker aims to give you a more holistic view of your software and give you advice, but it can't fix code for you. As a developer, it's your job to decide what fix works best for you. Okay, so that was an example of how we can follow some cautionary advice to find its root cause. We navigated our operational data and in doing so also navigated our source code. Cautionary advice is not all that's possible though. Informative advice can also be useful and something that developers often find themselves doing is looking through logs. Let's see a feedback driven development approach towards viewing logs. Again, here's some source code. Can you tell me how many times we've logged any of the debug, info, or error calls? It would be pretty important to know if we logged a lot of errors in production, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, source code by itself does not tell you what production is currently experiencing. It can only tell you what's possible. But adding some feedback-driven development-powered icons to the source code, the answer to those questions becomes obvious. Here we can see the error logs were never called, so that's good to know. And again, feedback-driven development icons are useful for getting the developer's attention, but don't tell us too much but basic information about how something is currently operating. Let's hit a keyboard shortcut to bring up the source portal again. And notice in doing so, the source portal automatically brings up the logs view. Again, the source portal changes what it looks like based on the source code you're currently viewing when you trigger it. Here we can see a summarized view of how many times each log pattern has been triggered in production. This is useful information, but just like when we're viewing summarized traces, we can get more detail by clicking the detailed view icon. And now we can watch the logs specific to this method in near real time as they're occurring in production. That's pretty useful, but let's say we aren't interested in all the logs inside this method, but rather only one specific one. We can click the one we're interested in, like so. And just like that, we have a near real-time feed of all the logs produced by the single statement in production. I hope those demonstrations helped you see how source code only tells part of the story, and only when you're receiving continuous feedback about your software are you able to program with a more holistic understanding of it. And while you may think continuous feedback is simply something that would be nice to have, I think it'll gradually present itself as something necessary to have. I think that becomes obvious when you look at the automation of software development. We've automated going from developing to testing with continuous integration. We've automated going from developing to releasing with continuous delivery. We've automated going from developing to operating with continuous deployment. All of these automations mark progress for the field of software development. However, we are living in a world powered by software which is consistently undergoing development. Software needs to evolve to remain relevant, so continuously updating it is necessary, but continuous delivery without continuous feedback is very, very dangerous. The more we rely on software, the more we amplify the ability for software bugs to cause damage. If we're going to be continuously delivering and deploying software, we must also be continuously receiving and utilizing feedback about that software. And this is what feedback-driven development, aka continuous feedback, allows us to do. And I believe in doing so enables us to finish removing the gap between software development and software operation. And I believe removing that last little bit of gap will result in what's known as live software development or interactive programming. Live software development is the result of merging software development with software operation. In this style of software development, there is no gap between software development and software operation. When you're programming, you're literally modifying the currently operating software. And when you modify the currently operating software, there is no need for deploying updates. You effectively deployed your changes by virtue of making them.
I believe this to be where software development is headed, and I think feedback-driven development is the precursor, and I'd like to use my last remaining slides to envision that transition. Let's start with standard software development. We have our development team that develop, build, and test their code with development requests, which ideally mimic production requests as much as possible. They then use the feedback they receive from testing and go back to developing where everything works as expected and their code is deployed and operated in production where it eventually starts experiencing production requests. One thing to notice in this diagram is that the operations team is not needed to help developers test software. They are able to do this all themselves because whenever they test, they get immediate feedback. However, whenever the software receives production requests which cause it to act incorrectly, it is the operations team that gives feedback to developers. This delay in communication is one of the primary reasons why there is still a gap between software development and software operation. Feedback-driven development comes in and says, OK, in the same way developers can see how their code operates during development is how we're going to let them see how their code operates during production. And this essentially automates away a portion of the operations team. I've added a robot to the operations team to signify some of their responsibilities have been automated. Now, this is just what's known as analytic feedback-driven development. While I do not show it in the demos, there's another stage of feedback-driven development, which is called predictive feedback-driven development. Predictive feedback-driven development says, hey, I'm noticing that there are correlations between development requests and production requests, which drive correlations between development feedback and production feedback. It then uses those correlations to offer future predictions for how the software will operate in production based on how the software operates locally. For example, let's say I write code which calls a method in a loop several times, and locally that method executes very fast but in production, that method takes a long time to execute. What predictive feedback-driven development does is, while you're writing that loop, it tells you that if you deploy this code, it will take a long time to run in production. This would then allow developers to foresee and avoid certain production issues. In this case, now I can consider using some sort of transaction or batching logic and avoid calling that method in a loop. Since it's typically the operations team which have the metrics and ability to predict how production will respond to changes in traffic, and predictive feedback-driven development gives this ability to software developers, I've added yet another robot to their team to show how more responsibilities are being automated away. Finally, all this continuous feedback will allow us to finish merging software development and software operation so that developing software is indistinguishable from operating software. There won't be a development environment, there won't be an operations team, and testing and production will be considered safe and conventional. This is the promise that live software development offers, and I think it'll primarily offer that through automatically wrapping feature flags to every change which developers introduce. These feature flags will progressively become more comprehensive and will allow developers to make changes in production safely and efficiently. If you're interested in how exactly that would work, I'd recommend looking into deployless architecture, specifically dark lang and large darkly. If you're still having trouble seeing how developing and production could ever become a reality, let's look at this logically. We established early on that the lines between software development and software operation are blurring. This is primarily due to software automation, a key component to the DevOps approach. Started with automating away the difficult process of building software with continuous integration, and we automated away the difficult process of releasing software with continuous delivery followed by automating away the difficult process of deploying software with continuous deployment. And we've even automated away the difficult process of monitoring software and making sure it's both running and running correctly with continuous monitoring. All that remains is the fact that the operations team operates or controls production, primarily because they're aware of the metrics which indicate the health of the software and are able to use those metrics to know and predict how the software is or will perform. And these are precisely the abilities analytic and predictive feedback-driven development gives developers through continuous feedback. After all that, all you're left with is a production environment which is governed by a team with no responsibilities. And in the same way that DevOps removed the specialness of getting things into production, live software development will remove the specialness of production. After all, if we're able to safely build, release, deploy, monitor, and operate in production, then there's nothing stopping us from safely planning, coding, and testing in production as well. And this is what I believe will become normal for software developers, at least until automation takes over software development as well. Thanks for listening. If you want to follow the progress of SourceMarker, you can see the GitHub repo right there. It's github.com slash source plus plus slash SourceMarker. We are very close to our first release, so maybe give it a star and watch for releases so you'll be the first to know when it happens. And finally, I would like to thank the Apache Software Foundation and the Apache Skywalking team, specifically Wu Xing, for inviting me to speak at ApacheCon. It was very much an honor. Thank you.
test. I'm not sure if this is working, but if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Just leave that up.